In case you didn't realize, we live in a society. Except it's not just a society we live in. It's a system. An education system. An economic system. A multi-layered and multi-dynamic social and political system. A very sick system of systems. From capitalism to statism to patriarchy to colonialism to white supremacy. That mutually reinforce one another to maintain the violent and oppressive and suffocating and destructive status quo. One of the functions of this system is to co-opt, strangle, corrupt and starve our imaginations. As a result, for those who seek social change, hope is a rarity and despair is endemic. Surrounded by suffering, fear, pain, catastrophe and hatred, we feel powerless. The collective consciousness is drifting towards doomerism, fueled by climate and social crisis. Utopia is practically a naughty word. The abusive nature of the system drains us, changes us, molds us. The trauma it generates is multi-generational, and many of us can feel it in our very bones. The message is loud and clear. There is no alternative. The disimagination machine persists. We also live in the information age. A period where access to knowledge is far greater than at any point in human history. Many of us have access to the bountiful fruits of technological innovation that allows us to expand our horizons and connect globally. But have we fulfilled the potentials of these technologies or have we been enslaved by them? Consider some of history's greatest creatives and intellects. As the famous saying goes, I am somehow less interested in the weight and convolutions of Einstein's brain than in the near certainty that people of equal talent have lived and died in cotton fields and sweatshops. The class component is apparent to those who have explored the implications of capitalism on human potential. But I think we can also observe how many of today's Einsteins have had their minds tethered to technological tyranny. Not to sound like an anti-social media boomer, but we have allowed the multi-trillionaire corporations that control these vast and invasive technologies to rewire our very brains. We are constantly bombarded with information and attempts to seize our attention, and now many of us fight a daily battle with distraction, one that previous generations did not have to contend with in the same way. Van Gogh spent his mornings pondering and painting, not scrolling through Reddit first thing exploited by the dopamine and cortisol micro-hits embedded into the code. He was already depressed, mind you, but I don't think a struggling Redbubble or Society6 store would have made it any easier for him. We are only now beginning to see the consequences, 20 years into the information age. With these systems of systems corrupting our humanity, compounded by the psychological manipulations of the social media era, and with a general consensus that we're hurtling towards a horrible future, how do we break free? I believe it starts with a recognition of the importance of imagination. We're not going to be liberated by technohopium, by green consumerism, or by politicians. We can't wait for governments, and we can't do this on our own. We are a social species. The only way we get free is together. But one of the first steps is the cultivation of our imagination. Imagination is an essential skill we must all work to foster. Things can change for the better, and they can change very quickly. Imagination is central to empathy, to creating better lives, to envisioning and then enacting a positive future. We cannot let this most critical tool languish. First and foremost, because imagination is vital to our health, particularly our mental health. In our brains, we have a pair of seahorse-looking blobs called the hippocampus, and it is the HQ of our imagination. Among the hormones it receives, the hippocampus is particularly vulnerable to cortisol, the stress hormone. Cortisol is the hormone responsible for fight or flight, and can be very useful. But in high doses, such as in late-stage capitalism, Cortisol can damage our hippocampal cells, reducing the hippocampus's size and volume and setting off a deleterious cycle of events. The more damaged the hippocampus, 
the more stressfully and pessimistically you experience reality, which results in even more damage to the hippocampus. And on and on. Capitalism is a mental illness generator. The policies and structures it upholds serves to weave stress, trauma, alienation, inequality, inadequacy, and anxiety throughout the social tapestry. The worse things get, the worse things look, and it becomes harder to imagine a way out. So, you've heard of capitalism killing our imaginations. Now get ready for climate change killing our imaginations. Global CO2 concentrations are currently at around 413 parts per million, and they're projected to reach 1,000 parts per million by the year 2100. Researchers estimate that such a concentration would reduce human cognitive ability by 21%. Even the 660 ppm by 2100 goal put forward by the Paris Climate Agreement would put us at a 15% decline in cognitive ability. But the greatest imagination killer, alongside climate change and capitalism, embedded in capitalism, emerging from capitalism, whatever, is the contemporary education system. Or rather, contemporary education system. Little has diverted from the damaging Prussian model of the 18th and 19th centuries. While imagination seems to come more easily for children, it has been banished to their domain exclusively and, through the school system, suppressed, removed, redirected, or re-educated as they age. Many children these days don't have an outside to play in, where they could create their own worlds and games and stories, but such freedom to roam is vital for their psychological well-being. When youth liberation advocates argue for the freedom of children from the domination of schools and parents, it is with the understanding that freedom, and especially freedom to play, which children are being robbed of more and more, is as essential to their potential development as learning to speak or walk. Without it, we're left with stunted and traumatized adults. Free, spontaneous and unstructured play teaches social skills, cooperation, creativity, resilience and conflict resolution. And in my view, play should be a robust and well incorporated element of our organizing. I believe we should play pretend about the future to explore different possibilities and then bring them to life. But it's hard for many adults to engage with play. I get it. School has done a number on people to devalue, undermine, manipulate and train our imaginations in order to maintain order and conformity. The education system is globally competitive at this point and in an effort for colonized countries to keep up with the demanding standards of the so-called first world, they must recreate the standard of sickness corroding our societies and our planet. Imagine if we actually committed to the project of learning. Imagine if we discarded its antithesis. Imagine if we availed learning to all and refused to restrict it to just one set time in one set place in one's life. Imagine if children were actually able to learn and to direct their learning and develop their skills and passions and selves in a dynamic, diverse and delightful environment. Imagine if we nurtured whole persons rather than limiting them to the confines of profit and hierarchy. For this task of revitalizing our imaginations, I believe nature can and should guide us. When we speak of peas in a pod, when we speak of running like the wind, when we speak of the bravery of a lion, when we ask, how deep is your love? It's like the ocean. Because human creativity, human language, human love, human thought is tied to the natural world. The separation we maintain with it now is artificial and in many cases detrimental to our well-being. The war against nature waged by industrial colonial capitalism is a war against ourselves and an affront to our imaginations. Imagination needs diversity to feed it. But monocultures, monopolies, and other monotonies strip us of that diversity. When we can draw from a palette of possibilities, marked in our memories, we're able to muse from the magnificent muse of the natural world. So if you want to spark your imagination, start by getting your hands dirty. Literally, the soil is about as diverse as it gets. We can further inspire and energize ourselves with the power of art and the stories it can tell. 
humans are storytellers, and we cannot afford to underestimate the power of stories. Whether we hitch ourselves to God's plan, Elon Musk's vision, Solar Punk or Desert by Anonymous, narratives shape our lives, our identities, our perceptions, and our actions. Stories may be inaccurate, incomplete, immature, or intransigent, but they are potent. Facts are not enough to change hearts and minds, but stories can. The way I see it, we cannot see the domain of imagination, of narratives, of stories, to dystopia. There may be constraints on the future, but we should not assume that such restraints require the special brand of pragmatism put forth by certain capitulators to the status quo. In fact, with limitations come opportunities. Haiku poetry may be limited to 575 syllables, but so much beauty has come out of it over the centuries. The same can be said for the stories we can generate from present conditions and future possibilities. Stories that can bring the future to life and help people let go of the past. Stories we can distribute and popularize over a wide, wide variety of media. Stories that inspire boldness and brilliance in community action to aim for a world we can thrive in together. This video has been inspired by and built upon the book From What Is to What If by Rob Hopkins. While I have my critiques of some of the constraints that underline the author's line of thinking, I highly recommend you all give it a read. It's chock full of examples, studies and case studies that can provide inspiration in this journey. One of the concepts that Rob Hopkins has generated that I want us to reflect upon is the imagination sundial, which I'd like to borrow from and push a bit further. The model is split into four sections, space, place, practices, and packs. Space involves creating, well, space. Carving out mental and emotional space and time to imagine more, do more, and act more. Connecting with others to share burdens and care, whether alloparental care, group meditation, peer support, or reading discussions. The space section cannot be divorced from other elements of the imagination sundial. Part of creating space must involve organizing to gain power over and minimize the monopoly of work on our lives, our time, and our energy. Place involves creating and transforming places that can allow us to bring together our imaginations, organize collectively, and implement the worlds we want to see, like food forest puma blitzes, street art events, squats and occupations, block meetings, maker spaces, libraries of things, skill shares, and even virtual collaborations. Practices involve connecting us with each other and changing our frame of possibilities. International solidarity allows us to come together and share stories and case studies of what's possible for everyday people committed to change. We can be inspired by and learn from the strategies and tactics of liberatory projects from Brazil to Mexico to India to Kurdistan. Yes and what if practices allow us to exercise our imagination and engage our hands and minds in the process of making the future. Packs are about making agreements to get things done. Our projects should not suffocate in isolation, but should strive to thrive in company. Worker cooperatives, housing cooperatives, farming cooperatives, unschooling cooperatives, alloparenting networks, student unions, tenant unions, workers' unions, abolitionist movements, permaculture movements, mutual aid projects, artist collectives, specifist units, neighborhood assemblies, and more, can and should convene, confederate, and catalyze action. I've spoken in the past about permablitzes, but I can see that style of one-day or weekend-focused event action being directed elsewhere too. These future blitzes can, for example, create what Jason Roberts called better blocks. Over one weekend, Roberts and a group of others transformed an abandoned block in Dallas into a vibrant block with sidewalk gardens, bike paths, outdoor seating, historic lights, and more. Guerrilla bottom-up placemaking, as he calls it, helps people to execute the changes they want to see in the places they inhabit. Communities are able to come together, imagine collectively, and tell their stories about their environment and their future. 
we seem to face insurmountable challenges. But as we rethink the stories we've been told and forge new ones with a renewed sense of resilient imagination, I believe we'll find many new paths to overcome our obstacles. Imagination is a fundamental component of our humanity. We just need to cultivate it. We can create what-if spaces for why not action, and we can do it today. Peace. Before you go, I'd like to announce the next channel community collaboration project. Solarpunk 2021 was really awesome, and I want to keep that momentum going. This time, we are launching a collaborative writing project. I want to hear your paragraph-long slice-of-life story or short but sweet poem of how things turned out okay. The word limit is 250, and I reserve the right to decline any submissions I feel go against the spirit of the project. After the deadline on February 28th, I'll put together all your pieces and read them in a video. For more details, join my Discord in the link below. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share with your fellow people. Thanks once again, of course, to the family, including our newest members, Judy Air, Sam Irish, Claire Obscure, Alex, Arthur, Robert McGill, and Lilytron. Join these beautiful humans and support me too on patreon.com slash true. Check out all my other videos for a range of radical topics. Follow me on Twitter at underscore true. Thanks again. Peace.